Hello, everyone, and welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 781 News. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the MBTA's Community Act, uh, joined uh, by the past Ward 7 City Councilor and friend of the show, Christine Mackin. We're going to be talking a little bit uh, about um, a nonprofit uh master plan meeting that happened uh last week that you probably didn't hear about because nobody heard about it um and then we're going to touch a little bit on uh the most recent city council meeting where the farm on beaver street was discussed at length uh this week i am joined by emily spirio hello josh gastorf hello james kakelis we're going to edit that in and, <laughs> and christine Mackin. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, we're going to start with the MBTA's Community Act first. Uh, so that is the um, topic we discussed at the last debrief where we had Tom on, where uh, Waltham made the cover of the Boston Globe, um, where we're being, where we are in we are very shortly going to be penalized $300,000 for not doing the things that the state wants us to do, which is to allow, which is to change up our zoning, uh, to allow more housing or make it easier to build housing along uh, um, the commuter rail station. Um, and so we are poised uh, to not look very good. Um, and so there's a lot of confusion based on the subject and uh, we've talked about it uh, in the show a months ago um, with Christine. And so we thought we'd invite Christine on to uh, allow folks to allow her to explain it in more detail to folks and also uh, give her a take on it. So thank you, Christine, for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Um, so I'm going to share my screen today um, and kind of go through a couple of points related to this housing choice law, starting with the uh, Boston Globe that was the original impetus to talk about this. Um, so for folks that didn't see it, um, as Chris referenced on December 4th, there was uh, Waltham made the front page of the Boston Globe because our housing authority is poised to lose $300,000 um, as part of the enforcement mechanism for the MBTA communities law, which is also called the housing choice law. One of the things the article says that I want to highlight is um, that of the 175 communities affected, at the time this article was published, only eight had failed to file the preliminary plans with the state, which are meant to define how the city is going to address zoning for increased density to come into compliance with the law. Um, at least one community highlighted in this article was threatened with losing money and that um, was enough of an incentive for them to file the plans to come into compliance. So Waltham still has time to do that. The city would have to submit a letter to the state by late-ish January um, with just, and I wanna say again, with just a preliminary plan on how they intend to come into compliance with this law. So this, uh, the housing choice legislation, I am showing actually here the original bill number that was passed in 2020 at the end of that legislative session. Um, this was originally put forward by Governor Baker and I think was kicked around a number of sessions of the state legislature before it was finally passed in 2020. So this is a bill that got a lot of work put into it. And you can, I think it's highlighted that this was a consensus package by the end, because in the Senate, it was voted in favor 40 to zero. Um, and in the House, it was voted in favor uh, 143 yes to four no. I have not checked if Waltham's representatives, Tom Stanley and John Lawn, voted in favor. I have assumed that they are because at 143 to four, it, it didn't seem worth my time to hunt that down. Um, but this is something that did have an incredible amount of support at the state level. I don't know of any other bills of this magnitude that passed with this kind of overwhelming, um, overwhelming support. The state also has put together a number of resources 
to help cities and residents understand what the law is and what changes it makes. I'm going to come back to some of the notes on this page, but I did wanna highlight, um, there are a couple of different resources that we're gonna post in the show link. So if anybody wants to go learn more after tonight, you'll absolutely be able to do that. As part of rolling out the housing choice plan, the state had a number of public meetings with cities and towns um, and held a webinar last September. Um, and I'm gonna share a couple of the slides from this to kind of explain what's going on with housing in Waltham from the context of this law and uh, a little bit more about what the state is asking us to do. So these are the slides from that September 8th webinar. And one thing I want to point out is that housing costs in Waltham are bananas compared to other states in the country. We've surpassed New York for how expensive the housing is, um, both in terms of buying a home and paying rent. Um, we're notably behind California and Hawaii in both of those categories. And then in home value, we're behind Washington and in rent estimates, we're behind in New Jersey. So this is really bad. I think it's not good to be the fourth most expensive housing market in the nation if you want to attract people to live in your communities, if you want to support people who've grown up in your communities who want to stay. Um, it, it's a serious, serious problem. The state also points out that municipalities have really restricted construction of new units in the last several decades, um, which is contributing to this growth in housing prices. If there's no new units, but there are more people, then the cost of housing goes up. That is supply and demand economics. Um, so what the state is asking is that communities that are served by the MBTA come into compliance with the state law. The way they do that is to increase the density of their zoning in regions that are close to their commuter stations or to their bus. And I do want to point out that during the listening sessions that the state had with communities, we were originally a bus community. We can, you can see there were that dark green. Um, and since those listening sessions, we've been, I'm going to say, downgraded to a commuter rail community. And I say downgrade because you can see that a bus service, the draft capacity requirement is 20% and the commuter rail requirement is 15%. So this is something where people in Waltham have been talking about it with the state and there have been changes made. So I don't think you can make an argument that Waltham was unaware of the requirement to alter this zoning. Since we are a commuter rail city, what the state is asking of us, Waltham needs to create zoning that increases the density. It seems like what Waltham needs is to add 4,000 units of housing uh, within range of our commuter station, but we don't actually have to add those 4,000 units to come into compliance. We only need to file a plan to do so. The other thing about this housing choice legislation that I said I would come back to is it changes the number of city councilors who are required to vote in favor of a zone change. For longtime council watchers, you'll remember that when a zone change comes in front of the city council, it takes 10 votes in favor to make that change. With this new housing choice law, it now requires only a simple majority. So that drops the threshold for a zone change from 10 councilors down to eight, which in theory should make it easier to pass these kinds of zone changes. Um, when the master plan committee was initially constituted, my assumption was that they were going to be talking about proposing zone changes back to the city council. Um, but as you guys have reported on that has not happened yet, but it is possible that we could be seeing zone changes in the next few years with this lower threshold of the number of votes based on this housing choice guidance. The law does not require luxury housing, but developers want to make as much money as they can, and they can make more money by building housing that is higher end and they can charge a higher rent. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, when I was on city council, I had this assumption kind of just based on a gut feeling that 
if you were building higher rent units in Waltham, it would sort of raise the amount that people would be charging for rent all across the city. Because if the option is a 3,000 square foot unit that is $4,000 a month, or a 25,000 square foot unit that is $2,000 a month, you're gonna take the less expensive one. But that means that everybody else who has older, smaller units is gonna raise their rent to kind of meet that bottom threshold. Um, I've been doing a little more reading up on the dynamics of housing markets since then. And I just want to point out this really interesting paper that came out earlier this year in 2021 that did a roundup of studies looking at what they call market rate development on neighborhood rents. Um, this paper looked at and did a really thorough analysis of six other papers that actually studied the impact of building more housing. And it, it does seem to come down to a fairly simple supply and demand that if you build new quote unquote luxury housing, if you build new market rate developments, it drops the rate of rentals in the entire nearby community that basically what I'm trying to say is that building luxury housing like this doesn't guarantee gentrification and it doesn't guarantee impacts to the neighborhood. Bringing that back to Waltham situation, what that means is that we have the capability to be thoughtful about what kind of zone changes we want to make so that we can enhance Waltham and not displace people who are already in the city. That said, we've had a year to think about it and we haven't done anything yet. The other comment from the mayor that I want to address before I stop talking is that I believe at one of the other city council meetings, she said that the state is harming the poor people of Waltham by taking that $300,000 away from the Waltham Housing Authority. And I really disagree with that assessment of the situation. This is a policy choice that the mayor of Waltham is making. The budget for the city of Waltham in the coming year is $300 million. The amount that the housing department is losing is $300,000. That is one tenth of 1% of the budget of the city of Waltham. We have the money to make up that gap. We have the ability to file a preliminary plan. We can help people in the city of Waltham, but the mayor has demonstrated that she's not willing to do this. And the city council has demonstrated that they're not willing to hold her accountable for the choices that she is making. And that is what is so frustrating about this situation to me, that there have, this is not an ignorant mistake. This is a choice that is being made by our leadership that is hurting the people who need the most help in Waltham. And I know we have an election coming up in the next year, and I hope people are going to think really seriously about if this is the kind of leadership they want to send back to City Hall for another two-year term. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and see if anybody on the call wants to ask questions or discuss further. Thank you for listening. So 4,000 units and they would, would need to be within a certain distance of the T. Um, we're all very pro housing on the show, I think, but just to look at what it might sound like to someone mm -hmm. else's point of view, 4,000 units, that's more than 4,000 people. The 2020 census said Waltham had about 65,000 people and the 2010 said it had about 61. So that means we grew it by 4,000 across the whole city in 10 years. So is it realistic to ask our city to add 4,000 units? And well, also, what is the time frame on that? Because that's a big part of the answer, I guess. That's a good question. And I actually have another statistic I want to add into this. I actually looked up the American Community Response Survey, which is run by the Census Department. And um, in their 2017 to 2021 data package, they said that Waltham has about 25,000 units of housing. So adding 4,000 units is an increase of 16%, which is a lot of new units of housing. Um, I think there, my opinion is that there are two things that we could be doing to add those new units of housing without really impacting quality of life for people who are already present in Waltham. And one is to start thinking about accessory dwelling units. This is something Newton did with a huge amount of success. And they actually did a great job doing consensus building and bringing the community along. What that means is that the city would make it easier to add 
density to already existing houses by legalizing what are called in-law apartments. There are people in Waltham who want this already. Uh, it could be done pretty straightforwardly. It would add density all across the city. Um, and everybody likes to complain about traffic. But the solution to that is just maybe not everybody in the household needs an individual car for themselves. Maybe we should be investing in alternate transit, but that's a side rant. The other thing I did, and I actually am going to share my screen again, um, is I was looking kind of just casually strolling along Google Maps in Waltham to see if, if I could drop a piece of housing anywhere in the city that I felt like it, where would I put it that would be in compliance with this housing choice law and minimize the impact on the existing uh, community that we have. So I just wanna point out that we have two commuter rail stations that are uh, impacted by this zoning situation. And there's one right here, that's the city center one. And there's one over here near Brandeis, um, which is the one that's closer to me. So I think we should start building housing on top of surface parking. If you zoom in here, you can see, look at that, surface parking. Uh, over here, surface parking. If you built housing on top of that surface parking, people could walk to the commuter rail. There's a bus line that runs north and south on South Street. You're developing on top of land that has already been developed, so you're not cutting down trees, you're not making a huge impact on the built environment, um, except that you're adding more units of housing in an area that already has development. Uh, the same situation is true over near the city center commuter rail station. It's, there's pockets that are smaller, but they do exist. Um, some of them are city owned, like right here, surface parking. Um, allegedly there's a hotel going in on top of, um, what used to be the train station and the florist. Uh, who knows if that's ever going to materialize, but you could build housing there if you wanted to. Um, now, now, Christine, would it be a reasonable yeah. expectation for the city to take the lead on something like this and like eminent domain properties that are not getting used and use properties that it owns and like use some sort of like the social housing thing? Like, would that be a reasonable expectation? I We're clearly not gonna get that with who we have, but yeah. I think that would be great. I would love to see the city eminent domain some of this stuff and build housing. Um, that would be phenomenal. Um, on top of that, if the city wanted to, it is legal under the US law to buy housing and then convey it to a developer or to buy land and then convey it to a developer. So the city wouldn't even have to become the developer if we had the political will to buy the land and sell it at a discount or give it to a developer for some nominal amount, like a dollar, we could, that is legal, it is allowed. And what kind of concessions would you get from a developer for that? Would you be able to like, like how can you enforce them like keeping like rents at something that's reasonable? Like, is there some way to like, I mean, because because that, that's kind of a issue with yeah. a lot of it, you know. That's a good question. And that's one of the tricky pieces with the housing choice law seems to be encouraging market rate development. Um, right now in Waltham, we do have a zoning provision that says that 20% of the units in housing developments over a certain size need to be benchmarked to a certain percentage of the area median income. So that would stay in place if the city were doing some kind of contract with the developer. I do not know of other cities in Massachusetts that have done this. Um, I expect if we wanted to go forward with it, we, it would take a lot of negotiation and somebody who has a better understanding of real estate law than I do to lay out exactly what the provisions are. But I'm sure we could do contracts and make choices that would allow development of below market rate units. Does the law contain a timeline for this? Is there a deadline? The only deadline I am aware of right now is to file the preliminary plan with the state by the end of January. So we could file a plan that said we're gonna add 4,000 units over the next hundred years? I, the plan is not to lay out exactly how we're going to get to 4,000 new units. The plan that's required is to say, 
here are the changes we anticipate making to our zoning. And then you have time to work those changes to the zoning through the legislative process. And then there's an additional delay while the developers get it together to be in compliance with that new zoning. So under no circumstances are we expected to add 4,000 units of housing in X number of years. What's required is that we update our zoning. So that, that leads up to kind of what for me is the big question is, so what the deadline required a plan uh, the mayor could have chose to ask somebody to put together, for lack of a better word, a bullshit plan, um, but she didn't do that. Um, what should we take from the fact that she didn't do that? Does that mean she's trying to send a clear message to her administration that we're just not doing this and we're ignoring the law and we're not going to pretend to follow the law? Or is mm -hmm. it possible there's something else going on here? That's a good question. And I wish I could see inside her mind and figure out why she's doing this. And I was thinking about that a little bit earlier today. Like, is this sending a message? Is this just recalcitrance? Is this normal conservative mode of operation? And honestly, <laughs> I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but what I came down to is it doesn't matter what the motivation is. What matters is that this is hurting people in Waltham and that's not acceptable. Yeah, one of the talking points uh, I saw from some Facebook comments was, oh, well, this must be a clerical error, like they must have screwed up like the, the train horns. And so I would just like to ask you, even though you've said it like six months ago, this was not a clerical error. This was a decision by the mayor to not do this, right? I can't put out side the realm of possibility that the mayor forgot or decided this wasn't important um i mean you've got, in my, yeah <laughs> go ahead uh i noticed on reddit when it was posted someone actually got a response from the mayor and she responded uh like saying some egregious lies about the city the the state or the mta mandating that it needs to be four thousand luxury apartments mm -hmm. uh and that she basically why she didn't do it. So it could be that she forgot, and this is a post hoc rationalization. Yeah. Uh, she tends she tends to work a project like she focuses on one thing at a time, and she might have a number of other things bubbling in the background. But she she does tend to be a little tunnel vision on whatever's going on at the moment, and there's always a lot going on in the city. So it's possible that this got put to the wayside. But at the point when the state has said we are going to revoke your funding and you have two months to come up with a plan, like you could start getting a plan together. Hmm. Eight weeks is not nothing to, to hold a city council meeting and to put some things down on paper and say, here's our preliminary plan. I'm very sorry, we, mean, we need more time. Uh, don't cut the money now. I promise we're working on it. And she has not done that. So there could still be value in people in the community pushing her to do that because there is still some time to do it, even though it's maybe the hardest time of the year to, to mobilize people mm -hmm. because of the holidays. Um, but if if it, it is still possible that we could mobilize as a community and, and get that money back for the housing authority. That's my understanding is that if we get that plan in by January 20th, we can. And maybe you don't even do it during the holidays when everybody is signed off and logged off and spending time with family. Like maybe you come back January 2nd and your your, your New Year's resolution is get the mayor to make a dang plan. Thank you. Good to know. Well, thank you very much, Christine, for coming on and in explaining this further. I don't feel like enough people are talking about this. And so I'm glad we have the platform to be able to highlight this. Uh, and if just, I'm sure in other major cities where this is happening, they're actually talking about it. Yeah, like I said, there's at least one city that got a notice their funding would be revoked and turn around and filed a plan. So the mm -hmm. incentives work. The question is, are they going to work in Waltham? And thank you guys for having me on and giving me a platform to talk about this because I think it's really important. Um, so I appreciate you all for what you do. Thank you, Christine. Thanks for coming on. So now we're gonna chat about uh, the most recent master plan committee meeting. This flyer went out to 
I, I, I don't know for sure how many nonprofit uh, nonprofits in the city. I'll say the major ones because that's who showed up to this meeting. Um, but this is a flyer that uh, was emailed. It says the Waltham City Council Master Plan Ad Hoc Committee and Mayor Jeanette A. McCarthy are giving you an opportunity to provide input on the updating of the, Walt the city of Waltham's master plan. And it uh, gives you um, some options over what you want to talk about if you uh, care to do that. Um, this looks very similar to the other uh, flyers that went out for the ward meetings. It's essentially saying you should come and give your input on the uh, master plan uh, that's being formulated by the master plan committee. Um, and we heard about this uh, just through like chatter, like someone, had, some a friend of mine said, oh, did you hear about this meeting? We're like, oh, I, I did not hear about that. Um, and so we did a little digging and we went to the bulletin board of truth and transparency um, that we've talked about on our show in the past. Uh, that's right outside city hall, which is where every single uh, city meeting need, it needs, it needs to be posted there. Um, this flyer was not there. Um, it was not anywhere that the city requires meetings to be. So we were confused if this was even going to happen. So, um, our friend James, James Berkelis, uh went and uh, recorded uh, this, uh, the meeting as he's been doing uh, for the past year uh, when the city fails to do so. Um, and so this meeting did happen. It, it was a real live meeting. Uh, the only uh, evidence is on our YouTube channel. Um, you can watch the recording there. Uh, the pro, there's many issues with the recording. There's the the sound is awful because the city didn't even turn on the microphones. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so at this meeting, there was it was not a meeting of the Waltham City Council ad hoc committee on Waltham Master Plan. That did not happen. What happened was. Uh, a couple of municipal staff, uh, I saw John Gollinger there, uh, head of the Waltham Housing Authority, and I didn't even recognize the other person, um, uh, was there, the mayor was there in the audience. And so essentially, uh, this meeting was just like a chance for the nonprofit leaders to um, say their piece to the staff to a couple staff members of the city of Waltham. Um, and so we immediately, or I guess I should speak for myself, I was curious, I was like, isn't this an open meeting law violation? Why did the city not advertise this meeting? Um, it should be uh, it should be properly advertised as all things are. Um, and so I called up uh, my friend and uh, city clerk, Joe Bizard, um, and I was like, Joe, like I'm really close to just like filing a complaint. Like, can you walk me through like how this isn't an open meeting law violation? Joe, uh, I think pretended to not understand, uh, not to not be aware of this meeting. I, I'm pretty sure he was. Um, but after a long conversation, he explained to me that because there wasn't a quorum, uh, because the attendees of this committee were not actually present, that it did not need to be properly advertised because there was no quorum. And so, and so I like did a little digging, uh, James emailed the state to confirm this. And I think we, we, we got to a point where we're like, okay, we're not gonna buy them because this wasn't actually a meeting of the Waltham City Council ad hoc committee uh, on master plan. So I, I hope that people do watch uh, the video that we put online because it's because it was a uh, star studded panel um, we have great nonprofit leaders in this city um, in, in attendance, uh, just to name drop a few people, a few of my friends. Uh, you had Sonia Wadman, the executive director of the Waltham Land Trust. You had Stacey Daly, the executive director of the Waltham Field Station. You have Carolyn Minato, the executive director of the Community Day Center. You had Mary Michelle Alexis, the executive director of Healthy Waltham. You had Genevieve Tavera, uh, the community organizer of Washington, D.C. Uh, those people all gave input. Um, in the audience, I also noticed that Herb from the Waltham Historical Commission was there, as well as Julian Jumba of Africano. Uh, this was an awesome meeting. Uh, and I think 
it was incredibly disingenuous of the city of Waltham to say that they were going to be meeting with the master plan uh, committee when that was never the intention. In fact, it, it, re it leads to some curious questions like, did the mayor of Waltham tell the master plan committee not to come? Because if they had come, then there would have been a quorum and then that would have been an open meeting law violation. Did she get lucky and just none of them showed up? And then it became a safe non-quorum. And so I'm actually, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't really know what the plan was, but to send out this flyer, I think it was incredibly disingenuous of the city to send this flyer out, which says the, uh, that your nonprofit has the opportunity to give input to the master plan committee to, uh, with the committee's names on it. Yeah, to include in that flyer the list of members and the chair uh, the, for these very important nonprofits that have way more important things to do than to give a speech in front of an empty room that goes unrecorded and with the microphone not on. Uh, and to include that the audience the, that for them was supposed to be these important members of the city council, for none of them to be there except for the mayor um, and admin support uh, from housing uh, authority. Um, I think it was incredibly disingenuous and insulting, and uh, but I hope that you do watch the meeting because the things they said were very powerful uh, and very um, worthwhile. And often these kind of voices don't actually get heard in the city, which is why I was excited um, to to hear from them. Uh, just to give you a short synopsis. I took some notes. Uh, the Waltham Land Trust listed several municipal properties that they'd like to see deed restricted for open space in the master plan. Healthy Waltham, uh, the executive director of Healthy Waltham, brought up that inner city transportation needed to be better prioritized to better service residents. Uh, they've always uh, been very good at talking about the relationship between uh, food insecurity and transportation. We talked about that on the show, and I was glad to see an executive director of one of the most popular nonprofits in the city talking about the same thing. Um, they'd also see, like to see better collaboration between nonprofits, and that could be uh, serviced from the city of Waltham by providing space at little to no cost uh, for uh, meetings between these uh, nonprofits. Um, Watch CDC had very emotional pleas from renters asking for help from the city of Waltham, uh, as well as watch advocating for their piece of legislation that they've been trying to push that we've talked about on the show before, which is in to include uh, ways to get rental assistance and also a copy of um, renter rights, um, tenant rights uh, in every lease that gets signed in the city um, that has so far has gone nowhere. Um, and, the farm, uh, the Waltham Field Station, uh, talked about the need for no agricultural uh, space to be depleted um, with the new lease for the field station, uh, as well as looking for clear uh, steps that are going to be taken for the tenants of the field station. Um, ironically, uh, just this most recent city council meeting, it was revealed that there will be no clear steps and that it will just be very confusing uh, again from here on out uh, for the foreseeable future uh, with no one's, uh, no one is sure that they're actually going to be at the field station anymore, not even the fields, not even the farm. Um, and so we're going to talk about that uh, at a later point. Um, and so uh, I did not really plan to talk that long. I apologize. I know James, you had a, a couple of comments to make as well, as you were uh, one of the only few people uh, in the world to be at that meeting. Um, but uh, I thought it was a great meeting. I thought the city of Waltham did not take it seriously, and it was incredibly disingenuous to send that flyer out to people. It definitely seemed like a bit of a rug pull for, especially like the people like Watch who went through the trouble of organizing the tenants to come in and give testimony and stuff, and then just to not even have any public officials there at all with no indication that would be the case from the invitation. And it just, that didn't sit particularly well. But the, some of the, and also like out of all the nonprofits in the city, that the prominent nonprofits that were invited, obviously WCAC was not among them. So That's funny. The, uh, yeah. The, um, and also like between like, I mean, it, it did strike me how like tenuous things seem for a lot of these nonprofits between like mm -hmm. 
healthy healthy Waltham asking for like a permanent location so they can continue to serve people and clearly not much interest at the city level in that and then like then then you've got like the farm losing it's losing its ability to be a tenant potentially and then you've got like again the, the respect at which they treat these nonprofits is pretty clear from the way this meeting was conducted absolutely and just to be clear cities have the power to do pretty much whatever they want like as long as there is political will you can pretty much do whatever you want like the city of waltham could provide space for health Waltham to be anywhere uh to, in, in a municipal building city of waltham could just put out the rfps mm -hmm. necessary to uh allow the farm to be mm -hmm. in perpetuity forever um and so clear, they're just none of, these, not none of yeah exactly none of them they choose not to and it's not like they they, they have it's within the capability of like or capacity of the city government to do anything that they want to within this it's just, one of the other things too is that it wasn't attended by any of the members of the count the committee but there were other counselors that were there like Colleen Bradley MacArthur and Paz and Jonathan Paz were there so it was kind of pointed like who wasn't there I guess so like the master plan <laughs> the members of the master plan i i my, my thought was if i was on the master plan committee i would be annoyed because it didn't it seemed whether they were um expected to be there or not it, it wasn't at the time that was good for city councilors it was 10 a.m on a monday mm -hmm. and most of them have other jobs yeah that and, was a point we didn't bring up yeah thank you yeah and um the other thing is, you know, they already invested a lot of time in listening in all these sessions. They sat there and listened to people for hours. So now if you do something that makes it look like they don't want to listen, it kind of undermines the work they've already done. Mm -hmm. And it kind of like, you know, when you tell people that come on in to talk to the master plan committee and you come in and none of them are there, it kind of, and you don't know the story behind that, it kind of undermines them putting all that time into making it, you know, looking like they want to listen. Um, so I wonder, I'm really curious what happened behind the scenes and what the master plan committee is going to do now, because there's this big question mark of whether they're still going to reschedule the other meeting they said they were going to do. If I were to guess, I'd say they're probably going to reschedule it. And they, I mean, like they said they were going to, and it's just like for them not to, it would just make them look really bad. Uh, and lastly, on our show, we're going to talk a little bit about the farm. This is going to be a larger conversation, definitely. Um, if you haven't seen the most recent city council meeting, it is a couple hours long, um, talking about the the mayor talking about the state of things on Beaver Street uh, at the field station. Uh, we're going to give a short synopsis uh, from our friend Emily Superior, um, but we need to regroup as a team to really be able to give the right messaging and the very thorough explanation of where everything's at um, and what it actually means for the future of the tenants. Uh, but we're happy to have Emily on to talk about essentially what happened. The cliff notes, please. So the mayor came into Committee of the Whole this week and uh, was available to answer a number of questions about what's going on um, with what she's now calling the licensees, the former tenants at the Waltham Field Station, or what used to be called the Waltham Field Station 240 Beaver Street. Um, and I think she may have touched on a little bit the parcel across the street as well, which is the land adjacent to the Girl Scout area. Um, the two main takeaways I took from the questions and answers asked and answered were um, number one, uh, there's um, serious and significant environmental remediation to do on the site, both in the land and in the buildings. Um, and number two, um, tenancy is not guaranteed for current licensees, aka a past tenants. Um, in terms of the uh, the environmental remediation, this is something that I. I was pretty well aware of for a long time, primarily because I am what I call a farm nerd, and I've just been collecting documents about 
the formal field station for a number of years because I'm interested in it. The mayor referred in, in, in the question and answer to a number of times to a proposed uh, sust uh, sustainability station um, that at one point UMass was hoping to develop on the land. That did not materialize, but this is a study that was done in 2010 um, looking to see what could be done on that land by UMass when UMass owned it and was still thinking about being active and engaging on that land. Um, so that's where this information is coming from. And part of what they did in the study uh, was look at um, the environmental conditions there, the history, et cetera. And it can also put a link to that with the video if that's helpful for anybody. Um, but what I wanted to show you is she mentioned um, the environmental contamination and specifically fly ash more than once at least. So here's Beaver Street. Here's our community gardens, Green Rose of Waltham. And the terms get really confusing. The mayor really used incorrect terms, which is not helpful to the conversation, but this is Green Rose of Waltham Community Gardens. Um, this is uh, the Boston Area Climate Experiment, ex Boston Area Climate Experiment here, which is um, the sort of the, uh, the skeleton hoop greenhouses. This is the administrative building. This is parcel one. Parcel one includes a small fly ash plot, approximately 200 cubic yards located south of the corn lab. So they used to do a lot of um, experiments and research on corn and maize. So that's what the corn lab was. Um, removal of the fly ash has been recommended. Um, a release tracking number has been filed for this plot. Removal expect is expected prior to 10609. I've never been able to find any information indicating that it ever was removed. And the mayor's comments that the fly ash still needs to be remediated um, suggest to me that it was never removed. I can't say with certainty, but the way she put, the way she posed some of the words, it made it seem as if it was somewhat of a surprise that we had to do all this remediation. Um, and I hope I'm wrong that she uh, posted as a surprise because this information is very easily available online if you just search field station, you know, and look up anything about the history of the field station. Um, so it absolutely, to anyone with any interest in the field station, uh, the farm um, should absolutely be aware of that. It's been a concern of mine. It should be should have been a, a legal and financial concern of theirs. Um, and she indeed said it was, and that's how they were able to negotiate down to $17 million. So they were apparently aware of it. Um, and, and And that is okay, in my opinion, because it does need to get remediated. Uh, we also know that there's been asbestos in that main administration building for many years, including when um, any number of wor workers from the nonprofits, I mean, from way back when, from the field station workers, the mass workers were working there through nonprofits, you know, including farm workers. I myself was uh, one of the farm workers there, and there's asbestos that still needs to be remediated in that building. As a former worker there, I agree that building needs to come down. It is um, very difficult that will displace the nonprofits physically, but as a safety measure, it just has to happen. From my opinion, there's just no, just no way around it. Um, however, I think that for what these organizations contribute um, in, uh, in the past, it's, I just wonder if there's any um, allowance for a right of first refusal on tenancy. Um, maybe perhaps someone with more um, background on these types of situations might have insight into that, but that's where we're looking at, um, you know, the do not have current leases, 
releases they ever had were with UMass. Um, and the mayor has made it very clear that not just technically, but um, she seems to have some emotions around there being no guarantee that the current licensees may not um, get those leases. Um, and and what and and either way, one thing that there will need to be some adjustments because adjustments as the land is remediated, um, that land won't be able to be farmed, which again, from a safety perspective, I think is perfectly reasonable. My hope, um, you know, from a resident perspective, as someone who, you know, as a former worker, as someone who eats food from there, is just that we can find a way to keep everyone as safe as possible, do the remediation, but also find a way to accommodate these organizations and work with them because right now it feels like there's a struggle of the mayor versus these organizations and it's just not productive. Emily, what is fly ash? All right, so here's where I'm not an expert. Let's do a deep dive. It's, it, fly ash is from coal-fired power plants. It's the Thank stuff you. that is going, getting, uh, they've got like a, a uh, filters that they like suck, collect it on on the as it goes out the top, but it's like the stuff that would otherwise be going up in the air, from my understanding. And it was, it was used. Uh, they were like, experimenting with it as a fertilizer, I think, but it is now known to be extremely carcinogenic. I, I hadn't heard about the fly ash, but at the same time, it was a uh, 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 like a university site, so it doesn't make sense they were using it that way. It from where it looked on this on the map, it looked like a pretty 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 small plot, but also, there's just like roads and stuff all around here. I have to, and I think they mentioned there was a bunch of illegal dumping that had happened too. So, hopefully, that all gets cleaned up without like displacing the tenants for too long. I guess there's really no clear path forward for the um, uh, the uh, community farm as as it currently is. Like, do they have any other places in the city that they could operate out of? So there is plenty of um, you know they they don't operate on you know a whole lot of acres and the city you know does potentially have other agricultural lands coming up for lease now the issues really are that that organization and i think and i think the argument that they have as the strongest you know one of the strongest applicants even without putting pen to paper is that that organization has been there for decades cultivating the soiler soil, you know, to the best of their ability, doing their own, you know, can't quite say remediation, but you know, using organic methods to um, bring vitality to the soil as much as they can. And any soil they, they start with, um, you know, you're looking at minimum one season of getting that soil, you know, just sort of enriched naturally um so being being a seasonal operation my hope would be that they would allow these licensees to at least stay there through this current season just to allow literal food growth um through the process and have the deadline of the following year, perhaps. I think it would be, you know, um, it is difficult with the environmental remediation. So I think that's got to be the priority. That said, um, we were supposed to be able to have the farm on, is it Warren Street? Um, that was supposed to be a food production farm that's turned into a tree nursery, which is great. Um, but also it's the site by the school, right? By the high school, yep, eventually. So 
it, it, there, some of the possibilities are not ideal, but the sooner they can be looked at, the better. Um, and I suspect that I suspect that Waltham Fields Community Farm is having those internal discussions, um, you know, and working with their partners and what's a really, really resilient farming community to see basically what they can do to produce food next season. Hopefully it will be on this land. Um, I just think it the most important thing is that the mayor can support growing food in the city of Waltham. And if we can understand that the remediation needs to happen and we need to make some adjustments, um, but support the organizations that are providing food in town is just really the most important thing, I think. I don't quite understand. She's got some frankly host hostile tone in her voice about it and that I don't understand. So next steps uh, is George Darcy, the Ward 3 city councilor, uh, either asked for or put into motion a citizen input hearing, if I recall correctly, um, for sometime next month. So we'll get the date of that hearing when it is announced, if it uh, is announced. I think George might've just been asking to create one as well. Um, so we're gonna keep an eye on that. This is a very important conversation. Um, and one that will lead to changing the fate of the people that live on Beaver Street, uh, do work on Beaver Street. Um, so we will keep up to date on that. And thank you, Emily, for uh, explaining that further. Absolutely. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our debrief. Uh, a lot of info here. Uh, I was very pleased with how this went. Um, and we will be back next week for committee meetings. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for giving your input. Thank you to Christine. Thanks, everyone. Happy Festivus. <laughs> Hi, everyone.